my sister framed me so she could take my place. But when our parents came begging for help, I turned my back and walked away. I don't expect advice but maybe someone out there can relate. For as long as I can remember, my parents made it very clear that I wasn't wanted. My mom, Kelly, was the queen of backhanded compliments and lies while my dad, Greg, was the kind of man who didn't need to say much. His silence was its own punishment, but when he did speak, the words were like bullets. He was never around when I needed him and when he was, I wished he wasn't. Growing up in that house felt like living inside a pressure cooker. It wasn't just the screaming matches or the passive-aggressive comments. It was the constant feeling of walking on eggshells. Every day was a new opportunity for me to do something wrong, something that would trigger their disappointment, anger, or straight-up disgust. For some reason, I was always the target. My older sister, Rebecca, was the golden child. She could do no wrong. No matter what she did, it was always praised. I remember once, when I was about eight, I accidentally broke a vase while playing in the living room. Rebecca had dared me to throw a ball inside, something we weren't allowed to do. Of course, the vase shattered, and she immediately started crying like she had nothing to do with it. Mom came storming in and before I could even explain she was yelling, why can't you be more like Rebecca? She spat at me. She never causes trouble. You're always screwing up, aren't you? The kicker? Rebecca got ice cream later that night while I was sent to bed without dinner. That was a common theme in our house, Rebecca getting away with everything while I was the punching bag. I used to love school because it was the only place where I felt remotely human. The teachers didn't scream at me and the other kids well they weren't exactly friends, but at least they didn't treat me like garbage. But even school wasn't safe forever. In middle school the bullying started. It wasn't just the usual teasing either. It was like people could smell the brokenness on me, like they could sense that I didn't have anyone in my corner. I was tall for my age, lanky and awkward, which made me an easy target. They called me giraffe or freak and shoved me in the hallways. One time, a group of kids even locked me in a janitor's closet for hours during lunch. I pounded on the door until my knuckles bled but no one came. When I told my parents about it, my dad just said, man up, gee life's hard and that was the end of the conversation. It didn't take long for me to stop trying at school. My grades tanked and by the time high school rolled around I was barely scraping by. I didn't care anymore. What was the point? No matter what I did, at home or at school I was just a failure. I don't know how I made it through high school. Honestly I barely did. There was one moment though that I think really broke me. It was junior year and I had somehow managed to get a spot on the track team. Running was one of the only things that made me feel free. When I was out there pushing my body to its limits, it was like I could outrun all the shit at home. I could forget everything for a little while. I wasn't the best on the team but I was good enough. We had a big meet coming up and I was excited. Like, genuinely excited for the first time in years. I told my mom about it, practically begging her to come. She barely looked up from her phone and just said, we'll see. Spoiler alert, they didn't come. My parents didn't show up to a single meet that entire season. It shouldn't have surprised me but it still stung. What made it worse was that all the other kids had their parents there, cheering them on. What? They couldn't be bothered. But that wasn't even the worst part. After one of the meets, I overheard my mom on the phone with a friend, talking about how disappointed she was in me. She didn't know I was there, just around the corner. Gee oh he's such a loser she said laughing. I don't even know what to do with him anymore. He's never going to amount to anything. That was the moment I realized she wasn't just angry at me or frustrated with my failures. She hated me. She genuinely hated me. And from that point on I started to hate myself too. I somehow managed to get into a local university, not because I was smart but because I just wanted to get away. Even if it was only for a few hours a day I needed to escape that house. I didn't even care about the degree or what I was studying. I just wanted out. The problem was college wasn't much better. I didn't fit in. Everyone around me seemed to have their lives together, while I was barely holding mine together with duct tape and prayers. I tried making friends but I just couldn't connect with anyone. How could I, when I didn't even know how to function as a normal person? One night, during finals week, I had a full-on breakdown. I hadn't slept in days and I was running on fumes. I locked myself in my dorm room and cried for hours. I thought about dropping out, about ending everything. What was the point of continuing if I was just going to keep disappointing everyone, including myself? But something stopped me. Maybe it was fear. Maybe it was some tiny sliver of hope that things could get better. I don't know but I decided to push through even if it felt impossible. After graduation things at home only got worse. I was stuck back in that house with no job, no money and no future. My parents didn't hold back their disappointment either. Why are you even here? My dad would say. You're an adult now. Act like it. But they didn't understand that I couldn't just magically fix my life. Every time I applied for a job I was rejected. Every time I tried to save money, something would come up that drained what little I had. I felt trapped. And then it happened. One night, during yet another fight with my mom, she said something that I'll never forget. I wish you had never been born. She screamed at me. You've ruined everything. It was like someone flipped a switch in my brain. I realized then that no matter what I did, no matter how hard I tried, I would never be enough for them. They would never love me the way parents are supposed to love their children. I packed my bags that night and left. I didn't have a plan, just a suitcase and the little bit of cash I'd saved up. I didn't know where I was going but I knew I couldn't stay there anymore. I moved to a new city, far away from my parents. I found a job, nothing glamorous, just enough to get by. For the first time in my life I felt free. I didn't have anyone breathing down my neck, telling me I was worthless. I didn't have to walk on eggshells anymore. It wasn't easy. 
I had to learn how to live on my own, how to function like a normal person. There were nights where I felt so alone that I wondered if I'd made the right decision. But every time I thought about going back, I remembered what my mom had said. I remembered the years of abuse and neglect and I knew that I couldn't go back to that. I still don't have everything figured out. I'm still struggling, still trying to piece together the broken parts of myself. But at least now, I'm doing it on my own terms. I'm not perfect, but I'm free. After moving to a new city and finally breaking free from my toxic family, I felt like I could finally breathe. I didn't have much, just a few hundred bucks saved up and a determination to make something of myself. I knew I had a long way to go, but at least I was no longer walking on eggshells every second of the day. For the first time in my life, I had control over what happened next. I found a job pretty quickly, though it wasn't exactly what I had envisioned. It was at a call center working customer service for a tech company. The pay was barely above minimum wage but it was enough to get by. I rented a small dingy apartment and ate a lot of ramen. But I didn't mind. It was better than being at home. At first the job was rough. I had no experience and dealing with angry customers day in and day out wore me down. Every day, I'd get yelled at for things that were out of my control, and I often left work feeling like I was right back where I started, stuck in a cycle of being blamed for things that weren't my fault. But this time I couldn't run away. I had to stick it out. The thing is, I'm nothing if not resilient. After everything I'd been through growing up, I had thick skin. Slowly but surely I started to improve. I learned how to calm people down, how to solve problems quickly, and, most importantly, how to keep my cool no matter how much they screamed. It didn't happen overnight, but within six months I became one of the best employees on the team. The call center wasn't where I wanted to be forever, but it was a stepping stone. My manager, Chris, started to notice my improvement and gave me more responsibilities. I took on training new employees, handling the toughest cases, and even working overtime when no one else wanted to. I wasn't just surviving anymore, I was starting to thrive. One day, Chris called me into his office. I remember thinking I was in trouble for something, but instead, he offered me a promotion. You've been killing it, G. We want to make you a team lead. It wasn't a huge raise, but it was something. I would be overseeing a small team, training them, and making sure things ran smoothly. It was the first real recognition I'd ever gotten in my life. I accepted the promotion without hesitation and from that moment on, my career started to take off. Within a year, I moved from team lead to supervisor. Then, I got promoted to a project manager position, overseeing multiple teams across different departments. I couldn't believe how far I had come. My paycheck started getting bigger and for the first time I felt like I had real stability. I saved aggressively, learned more about the tech side of the business, and used every opportunity to improve my skills. Once I got into management I realized there was a whole new set of skills I needed to learn. Managing people was one thing, but managing entire projects, budgets, and operations? That was a different beast. I took online courses, read every business book I could get my hands on, and stayed late at work just to absorb more. I knew that if I wanted to keep moving up, I had to be the best at what I did. At one point, I became obsessed with productivity tools and techniques. I learned everything there was to know about process improvement, data analytics, and even coding. I wasn't content with just doing my job well. I wanted to be irreplaceable. The company noticed. Before I knew it, I was offered a position as an operations manager, overseeing multiple call centers across the country. My salary skyrocketed and for the first time in my life I felt financially secure. I had been living frugally for so long that when I finally started making real money, I didn't know what to do with it. I was still living in that tiny apartment, driving the same old beater of a car and eating cheap food. But after years of scraping by, I decided it was time to treat myself. That's when I bought the car. A sleek, brand new luxury sports car. It cost $120,000, more money than I'd ever imagined spending on anything but I didn't care. I wanted something that represented how far I'd come. Something that would remind me that I had made it. I walked into the dealership half expecting them to laugh at me but when I drove off in that car I felt unstoppable. The engine purred, the leather seats hugged me in all the right ways and for the first time, I felt like I truly had control over my life. Around this time I met someone. Her name was Natalie and she seemed perfect at first. We met through mutual friends at a party. Natalie was everything I thought I wanted. Smart, funny and ambitious. She worked in marketing for a big firm downtown and from the moment we started talking I felt like we clicked. We went on a few dates and before long, we were spending most of our weekends together. Natalie was charming, confident, and seemed genuinely interested in me and my life. For the first time, I felt like I had found someone who actually saw me for who I was. Someone who wasn't trying to change me or make me feel less than, but as time went on, things started to get complicated. At first, it was little things. Natalie was always busy with work, and it became harder and harder to find time to see each other. She'd cancel plans at the last minute or show up late, always with an excuse. I didn't think much of it at first. I figured she was just stressed like I was with my own job, but then I started noticing other things. She became distant, emotionally unavailable. It was like she was there physically but not really present. We'd be out at dinner and she'd spend the whole time on her phone, or we'd make plans for the weekend, and she'd flake without even telling me why. One night, I finally confronted her about it. We were supposed to go out to celebrate a promotion I had just received, but she cancelled last minute again. I couldn't take it anymore. Natalie, what's going on? You've been pulling away for weeks now and I don't understand why. If you don't want to be in this relationship anymore, just say it. She looked at me, surprised, like she hadn't even realized what she'd been doing. I'm sorry G. 
It's just, work has been so crazy lately. I didn't mean to make you feel like I don't care. I do, I really do. I'm just under a lot of pressure right now. I wanted to believe her. I wanted to think that everything would go back to normal once her workload lightened up. But deep down, I knew something wasn't right. I could feel it in my gut, but I ignored it. I didn't want to lose her. I didn't want to go back to being alone. Things didn't improve. Natalie kept pulling away and I kept chasing after her, trying to make it work. I'd surprise her with flowers, plan elaborate dates, anything to get her attention. But nothing worked. It was like she was slipping through my fingers and there was nothing I could do to stop it. Then one day everything came crashing down. I was at work, going through emails when I got a message from a coworker. Hey isn't this your girlfriend? There was a link attached to the message. I clicked on it and my heart dropped. It was a photo of Natalie, out at a bar with some guy I didn't recognize. They were sitting close, laughing, her hand on his arm. It was nothing incriminating but it felt like a punch to the gut. I had no idea who this guy was and she had never mentioned going out that night. I called her immediately. She didn't answer. I sent her a text. No response. The rest of the day I couldn't focus on anything. My mind was racing, filled with a million questions. Who was this guy? Why didn't she tell me she was going out? Was this the reason she had been so distant? When I finally got home that night, I found her waiting for me at my apartment. She looked guilty like she already knew what I had seen. I'm sorry G she said before I could even ask. I was going to tell you. I just, I didn't know how. Tell me what? I asked my voice shaking. There's someone else. I didn't mean for it to happen but, I don't know. We just connected. I've been trying to figure out what to do, but I didn't want to hurt you. I felt like the ground had been ripped out from under me. All the late nights, the cancelled plans, the excuses, it all made sense now. She had been seeing someone else behind my back. I didn't say anything at first. I just stood there numb. I wanted to scream, to yell at her for betraying me, but the words wouldn't come. All I could think about was how stupid I had been, how blind I was to everything. I'm sorry she said again but it didn't matter. The damage was done. She left that night and I didn't stop her. I didn't fight for the relationship because, in that moment I realized it wasn't worth fighting for. She had made her choice and I wasn't going to her to stay. In the days that followed I threw myself into my work even more. I worked late, took on extra projects, anything to keep my mind off of what had happened. But no matter how busy I was, the hurt didn't go away. I felt like I had failed again. Like I wasn't good enough just like my parents always said. But over time the pain dulled. I realized that Natalie's betrayal wasn't a reflection of me. It was her choice, her mistake, not mine. And for the first time in my life, I didn't blame myself for someone else's actions. Now I'm still here working hard rebuilding myself yet again. I'm not sure what comes next but I'm determined to keep moving forward. Because if there's one thing I've learned, it's that I'm stronger than I ever thought I was. I thought I had seen the last of my parents when I left home all those years ago. After everything they put me through, the emotional abuse, the neglect, I had no intention of ever seeing them again. I cut off contact, deleted their numbers and moved to a different city. Life had finally started to fall into place. My career was on an upward trajectory, I had built a life for myself, and despite the heartbreak with Natalie I was doing well. Then they showed up, like ghosts from the past, determined to tear everything apart. It was a Saturday afternoon and I was lounging at home trying to unwind after a long week at work. I'd been putting in a lot of extra hours lately, preparing for a big project launch at the company, so I hadn't had much time to relax. I was planning to take the car out for a drive later, maybe head to the coast and clear my head. The car, the one I bought for $120,000, my pride and joy, a symbol of how far I'd come, was parked outside, gleaming in the sun. That's when I heard the knock on the door. I wasn't expecting anyone so I figured it was just a delivery or maybe a neighbor. But when I opened the door I felt like I'd been punched in the gut. Standing there in the flesh were my parents Kelly and Greg. It had been years since I'd seen them and they hadn't changed much. My mom still had that icy judgmental look in her eyes and my dad still had that silent, looming presence, the kind that made you feel small just by being near him. I froze for a moment, unsure of what to do. Gee my mom said, her voice dripping with fake sweetness. It's been so long. I didn't invite them in. I just stood there, stunned, wondering why the hell they were on my doorstep after all these years. What do you want? I finally asked, keeping my voice as calm as possible, though my heart was racing. We need to talk, my dad said, stepping forward slightly. He glanced over my shoulder, his eyes catching sight of the car parked in the driveway. I could feel it immediately, the old dynamic coming back, the feeling of being powerless, of being that kid who could never do anything right. But I wasn't that kid anymore. I had worked too hard to let them drag me back into their twisted world. What are you doing here? I asked again firmer this time. My mom sighed dramatically, like this was all some big inconvenience for her. We've fallen on hard times G. We've had some financial difficulties and we could really use some help. We saw that car outside and well it's clear you've been doing pretty well for yourself. We were thinking maybe you could, you know, let us have it. Just until we get back on our feet. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. My parents, who had never supported me, who had made my childhood a living hell, were standing on my doorstep, asking for my car. My $120,000 car. The one thing I had bought for myself that I had worked so hard for. You want my car? I asked just to be sure I hadn't misheard. Yes, my mom said as if it were the most reasonable request in the world. You've always been so selfish G. We raised you, we took care of you and now when we need a little help, you act like we're asking for the world. It's just a car. 
I could feel my blood boiling. This was classic Kelly twisting everything around to make me the bad guy. To make me feel guilty. But not this time. No, I said firmly, you can't have my car. I'm not giving it to you. For a moment, there was silence. Then my dad stepped forward, his face turning dark. You owe us G. We're your parents. After everything we did for you, the least you can do is help us out. I couldn't help it, I laughed. I laughed right in their faces. Everything you did for me? You mean the emotional abuse? The neglect? The years of making me feel like I was nothing? You seriously think I owe you anything? My mom's face hardened. We made you who you are, G, don't forget that. No, I said, stepping forward myself now, feeling a surge of strength. I made myself who I am. I did this on my own. I don't owe you anything and I'm not giving you my car. Now get off my property. I slammed the door in their faces before they could say another word. I thought that would be the end of it. I thought that slamming the door would be enough to send them packing, that they'd realize they weren't going to manipulate me anymore. But I underestimated them. I should have known better. A week later, I received a letter in the mail. It was from a lawyer. My parents were suing me. They were claiming that they had helped me financially in the past, that they had contributed to my success, and that they were entitled to a portion of my assets, specifically, the car. The letter detailed how they believed they had a right to the car because, in their twisted logic, they had invested in me growing up and now that I was doing well, they wanted their share. I was floored. I couldn't believe the audacity. I hadn't taken a penny from them since the day I left home. If anything, they had drained me emotionally and financially for years. But now they were trying to take me to court over a car? It was insane. I immediately contacted a lawyer, a woman named Sarah, who came highly recommended by a co-worker. When I explained the situation to her, she was as baffled as I was, but she assured me we had a strong case. This is absurd. She said during our first meeting they have no legal claim to your car or your money, but we're gonna have to fight this and fight we did. The lawsuit dragged on for months. I had to go to multiple court hearings, submit documents and deal with endless legal back and forth. Every time I thought it couldn't get worse, my parents would up the ante. They painted me as an ungrateful son, a selfish child who had abandoned his family after they had sacrificed so much for him. Their lawyer, a sleazy guy named Martin, tried to make it seem like my parents had played a crucial role in my success, that without them, I wouldn't have been able to afford the car in the first place. It was all lies of course but the way they spun the narrative was chilling. It was like they were trying to rewrite history, to erase all the years of abuse and pretend that they had been supportive, loving parents. The worst part was seeing them in court, sitting there with smug looks on their faces like they were about to win. They showed no remorse, no shame for what they were putting me through. My dad barely said anything as usual, letting my mom do all the talking. She played the role of the concerned mother to perfection. Acting like this whole thing was just about keeping the family together and making sure everyone got what they deserved, but Sarah wasn't having any of it. She tore their case apart piece by piece, exposing every lie, every exaggeration. She brought in witnesses, friends from my childhood who could testify to the way my parents had treated me, former teachers who remembered how withdrawn and unhappy I was back then. She even got hold of some old medical records that showed the effects of the stress and anxiety I had suffered as a result of my home life. During the trial, my parents' lies started to unravel. My mom's story changed multiple times, and the more she tried to manipulate the situation, the worse it got for them. At one point, she even tried to claim that they had given me an inheritance when I left home, which was so far from the truth that even the judge raised an eyebrow. The turning point came when we brought in a financial expert who reviewed my earnings and spending history. He confirmed that I had never received any financial help from my parents, not even a cent, and that the car had been bought entirely with my own money, money I had worked hard to earn. It became clear to everyone in the courtroom that my parents had no claim to anything I owned. Their entire case was based on lies and manipulation, just like everything they had ever done, but that didn't stop them from trying to guilt me one last time. During one of the final hearings, my mom broke down in tears on the stand, sobbing about how hard it had been for her to see her only son turn his back on the family. She talked about all the sacrifices she had made, how much she had given up for me but I wasn't buying it. Not this time and neither was the judge. In the end, the court ruled in my favor, dismissing my parents' lawsuit as baseless and ordering them to pay my legal fees. I couldn't believe it. I had won. For the first time in my life I had stood up to my parents and I had come out on top. I didn't gloat. I didn't even look at them as we left the courtroom, but I could feel the weight lifting off my shoulders, the sense of freedom that came with knowing they no longer had any hold over me. They had tried to take everything from me but I had fought back and I had won. In the aftermath I cut them off completely. I blocked their numbers, made sure they couldn't contact me and focused on moving forward with my life. I had been through enough and I wasn't going to let them drag me back into their toxic world ever again. The experience changed me. It made me stronger, more determined to protect the life I had built for myself. I learned that just because someone is family doesn't mean they have the right to abuse you, to take from you or to control your life. I had fought for my freedom and I wasn't going to give it up. Now months later I'm still working hard, still driving my car and still building the life I deserve. I don't know what the future holds but I know one thing for sure. I'm done letting anyone, especially my parents, dictate my worth. I had finally started feeling like my life was my own again after the lawsuit with my parents. It had been a hard battle but I won. I cut them off completely and focused on moving forward. My job was going well and I was doing everything I could to keep the toxic past behind me. I thought the worst was over. Then something happened that shook me to my core. It wasn't my parents this time. 
It was someone from my father's past, a man I hadn't thought about in years. He came crashing into my life in the most violent and unexpected way imaginable. It was a Friday evening. I had just gotten home from work and was getting ready to relax. I had ordered some takeout and was looking forward to unwinding after a long week. The days were finally becoming peaceful again, and I had started to build a new circle of friends, people I could actually trust. I was sitting in my living room when there was a knock on the door. This time, unlike the one that had brought my parents back into my life, I wasn't expecting anything but my food. I got up, expecting to see the delivery guy but instead there was someone else. A man I recognized but hadn't seen since my childhood. His name was Tom. He was an old friend of my dad's, the kind of guy who was always hanging around our house when I was growing up. Tom and my father used to spend weekends together, mostly drinking and talking about whatever nonsense guys like them found entertaining. Tom was a rough guy, big, burly and always reeking of alcohol. I remembered him being loud and intimidating even as a kid, but I hadn't seen him since I left home, and now here he was, standing on my doorstep with a scowl on his face. Tom I said my voice shaky. I didn't know why he was there, but something about his presence set me on edge immediately. He didn't smile. He didn't greet me. He just stared at me and I could see he was drunk. His eyes were bloodshot, and the smell of alcohol hit me before he even opened his mouth. You don't drink with me anymore boy Tom slurred, stepping forward. What, you think you're better than me now? I was caught off guard. I hadn't spoken to Tom in years. I never drank with him in the first place. He and my dad had their thing but I was always on the sidelines. Now, out of nowhere he was standing at my door, accusing me of something that made no sense. I, I don't know what you're talking about, Tom I said trying to keep calm. I haven't seen you in years. You should go, but instead of leaving, Tom shoved the door open and barged into my house. I stumbled back, not expecting the sudden aggression. I tried to stand my ground but before I could react, he lunged at me, his fists flying. Tom was strong. He was big and his punches landed like bricks. He hit me hard in the stomach, knocking the wind out of me and then followed it up with a punch to my face. I fell to the ground, dazed, blood dripping from my nose. My vision blurred and for a moment, all I could see was Tom's angry face above me. You think you can just ignore me? Ignore your old man? You're nothing. Tom shouted, his voice filled with rage. You're just like him, G useless. I tried to get up to push him off but he was relentless. He kicked me in the ribs hard enough that I heard a crack. Pain shot through my side and I gasped for air, struggling to breathe. I could taste blood in my mouth. My heart was racing and my mind was spinning trying to make sense of why this was happening. It felt like the attack lasted forever. Every time I tried to get away Tom would pull me back hitting me again and again. My world was reduced to nothing but pain and fear. What saved me were the neighbors. I lived in a pretty quiet area but thankfully people were always out and about. Some passers-by must have heard the commotion, the sound of Tom shouting and me struggling. They rushed over to see what was going on and when they saw through the window that I was being attacked they called the police. I didn't know any of this at the time. I was barely conscious at that point just trying to protect my head and survive. But I remember hearing voices outside, people shouting for Tom to stop. The next thing I knew, a group of them had burst through the front door, pulling Tom off me and pinning him to the ground. I could hear the sound of sirens in the distance and I knew the police were on their way. I was too weak to move, barely able to open my eyes as I lay on the floor, battered and bleeding. One of the neighbors knelt beside me trying to talk to me, but their voice was muffled like I was underwater. Everything felt distant like it was happening to someone else. The last thing I remember before blacking out was the sound of the police arriving and Tom being dragged out of my house in handcuffs. When I woke up, I was in the hospital. My entire body ached, my head was pounding and my face felt swollen. I could barely open my eyes but I could tell I was hooked up to machines, forger rips, heart monitors, the works. I wasn't in great shape. A nurse came in a few moments later, checking on me making sure I was stable. You're lucky to be alive, she said, her voice gentle. You've got some broken ribs, a concussion and a lot of bruising but you're going to be okay. I felt a wave of relief but it was quickly followed by anger. How had this happened? Why had Tom attacked me? I didn't know him anything, I hadn't even spoken to him in years, and yet here I was, lying in a hospital bed, lucky to be alive. The nurse told me I had been unconscious for a while. The police had taken Tom into custody, and there would be a full investigation. Apparently, he had resisted arrest and even tried to fight the officers when they arrived. It wasn't looking good for him. It didn't take long for Tom to be formally charged with assault and battery. The police had all the evidence they needed, the witnesses, the injuries and his drunken state when they arrested him. The case was open and shut and I was ready to testify against him. When the trial came around I was still healing. I had been in and out of the hospital for weeks, dealing with the aftermath of the attack. My ribs were still sore and I had trouble sleeping from the trauma. Every time I closed my eyes I saw Tom's face, felt his fists and heard his rage-filled voice. But I wasn't going to let that stop me. I wasn't going to let him get away with what he had done. In court Tom tried to play the victim. His lawyer argued that he was drunk and didn't mean to hurt anyone. He claimed that he had been going through a rough time, that his drinking had gotten out of control, and that he didn't even remember the attack. They tried to paint him as someone who was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. A man who had made a mistake. But I wasn't having any of it. I took the stand and told the court exactly what had happened. I told them how Tom had barged into my house, how he had attacked me without warning, how he had been spewing nonsense about me not drinking with him anymore. I explained that I hadn't seen him in years, that I had no relationship with him, and that he had come out of nowhere, bringing violence and destruction into my life. 
The witnesses backed me up. The neighbors who had called the police testified about what they saw, how they had found me bloodied and beaten on the floor. The police officers who had arrested Tom gave their accounts of how he had resisted, how he had tried to fight even after the attack. The judge wasn't swayed by Tom's excuses. He saw through the lies, saw Tom for what he really was, a dangerous man who had let his anger and alcohol-fueled rage take control. Tom was convicted of assault and sentenced to prison. He wouldn't be hurting anyone else for a long time. After the trial, I focused on getting better. The physical injuries healed with time, but the mental scars took longer. I struggled with nightmares and flashbacks for months after the attack. I couldn't shake the feeling of vulnerability, the sense that at any moment, someone could come crashing into my life again, bringing chaos and violence. But I wasn't alone. My new friends rallied around me, supporting me through the darkest days. They visited me in the hospital, brought me food, and helped me with things I couldn't do on my own while I was recovering. For the first time in my life, I had people who genuinely cared about me, people who had no ulterior motives, no strings attached. I also started seeing a therapist. At first, I was hesitant. I didn't think talking to someone could really help. But after a few sessions, I realized how much I had been carrying for so many years. The trauma from my childhood, the abuse from my parents, the attack from Tom. Hit that subscribe button now, or you'll be the one asking, wait, what did I miss? while everyone else is cracking up.